and of those of you who are new, uh, welcome, welcome to us. Uh, just to give you a quick idea of who we are, um, we're a, a national charity. We were set up uh, 50 years ago to protect very historic or hugely important historic churches which no longer had a regular congregation for them. So we've got a master, a, a collection, although George said 365, which is easy, it's actually 356. Uh, easy mistake because there are 365 days in a year, but we take on about two or three more every year. So that means soon we will have 365. Uh, and um, we look after them on behalf of the nation. We open them up to the public for free, uh, so everyone can go and visit our churches. Uh, and, but actually, the heart of what we do is we run work with local communities so that they can use and love their historic place of worship. These are the most profound of historic buildings, I think. They have a relationship to place like no other, uh, and, uh, and they are the most democratic as well, because it doesn't matter what you believe, where you come from. It doesn't matter uh, who you are. This building really belongs to you, and, and our policy is to get as many people in to understand and enjoy these buildings as, as possible and help them look after them. Obviously it's been a difficult time as it has been for everybody across the country looking after uh, everybody. Uh, it's been difficult facing up to the implications of lockdown and, and COVID-19 uh, but we were very pleased this week to begin the opening process of our churches. Uh, they're not all open yet but some of them are. Please keep checking our website uh, to make sure that uh, where, where sites are open and slowly over time we'll get them all open and open to the public again and hopefully uh, doing events again because not being able to open our churches and not being able to do events has meant that there is something like a £500,000 hole in our finances in our income budget this year so please do consider uh, making a donation on the back of this uh, lecture as George outlined before and do sign up for membership but also you can even sign up for a free um, uh, a free newsletter that we provide as well. Just stay in touch with the work that we do. Uh, there's going to be a lot more work needed, I think, for dealing with historic churches in the countryside over the next few years. I think the impacts of COVID-19 could be quite large. So, um, one of the other things we have uh, going is, uh, is, a, is a tourism product called Champing, uh, where you can go and stay in our beautiful churches overnight. Um, it's champing.co.uk. And the, the reason I mention this is because uh, one of our Champing churches is St. Mary the Virgin in Fordwich in Kent. In fact, it's our most popular Champing church, but it just so happens to also have a wonderful stained glass window of the Annunciation by Martin Travers from 1936, which leads us beautifully on for me to introduce Michael Yelton who's going to do our lecture today an expert on the work of Martin Travers um, I believe Michael you retired earlier this year uh, from being a circuit judge um, and prior to that yes. you've been in practice for 25 years and taught law at Corpus Christi College and um, you've been writing extensively on Anglo-Catholic history and architecture and clearly very interested in these subjects. We had a little chat earlier and uh, the extent of your knowledge is quite frightening really. You're, <laughs> you, you've done the research and uh, a, a very very impressive knowledge uh, particularly about Martin Travers and, and you can actually acquire um, Michael's book. He has written a book called Martin Travers, His Life and Work, which is published by Spire Books, um, dated in, in 2016. And uh, Michael re reassured me that this holds up well four years later still. He hasn't found out uh, much that changes his views from, from that book. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Michael for our lecture today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and I'm very pleased that you're all here to listen, and obviously that people will listen and see uh, later. And in a few moments, I've got some slides that I want to show you, which show you some of Martin Travers' work over the years. As has just been said, uh, I'm not an art historian by training. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I was in practice at the bar for a long time and then a judge for a number of years. Uh, and uh, I've been interested in Martin Travers in particular uh, and various other forms of 20th century church architecture and furnishings for a long time. There are very few of us who are interested in 20th century church furnishings. But as with other things, if you look back 50 to, 50 to 60 years, nobody was interested in Victorian church uh, architecture and furnishings. And that's burgeoned in the last uh, time. So perhaps I'm ahead of myself. Let's look at Martin Travers then. Martin Travers was born in 1886 
and died at the early age of 62 in 1948. Whether his premature death from a heart attack, and he was only young, as, we, uh, see, as I've just said, had anything to do with his then recent marriage to a woman almost 30 years younger than him, history does not record. Travers was one of the leading stained glass painters and church furnishers of his age, particularly flourishing from 1919 to 1948. He benefited from the huge Russia work which kept all such artists unprecedentedly busy in the five years or so after the end of the First World War. It's something we don't often think about, but there never was a period in which church furnishers were busier than, than the four or five years after the First World War, because, as we know, nearly every church in England erected a memorial to those who had died, and in addition, there were many commissions uh, uh, in relation to individuals, some of which involved new altars, new windows, or, or uh, what have you. Travers himself had a large number of such commissions, many of them from Anglo-Catholic churches, uh, which was peculiar, bearing in mind his own life during the war, to which I'll come in a moment. Travers came from a family uh, which was rooted in the Anglo-Irish ascendancy and in the armed services. However, his own father departed from those traditions and became a brewer. He died young and seems to have been a rather weak man. Travers' mother, Gertrude, by contrast, was a strong-minded, overweening, some would say interfering, uh, woman. Martin Travers was born in Margate in Kent, brought up in Norwich and educated at Tunbridge School. I'm satisfied uh, having uh, read uh, an enormous amount that he has written, that he wrote, uh, that he was dyslexic because uh, he was not good at taking exams. And of course, dyslexia wasn't uh, a diagnosis at that time. And his spelling throughout his entire life uh, could be described as eccentric. And he often made mistakes in the drafts for stained glass windows, the plans for stained glass windows, which fortunately uh, didn't then usually occur when the windows themselves were made. From Tunbridge, he went on to the Royal College of Art, uh, which was then strongly influenced by arts and crafts ideas. And he later taught stained glass at the uh, uh, Royal College of Art for many years. After he left the college, Travers worked for a relatively short period of time uh, for Saninian Compa, who wasn't of course knighted then, as an improver, in other words, somebody who was improving in, in learning, uh, but he then set up on his own. He never was an architect uh, in the proper sense of the word. By the time he'd set up on his own, uh, in about 1909, uh, his mother had been widowed and she decided to move to London and look after her son, uh, which I don't think was entirely welcome. He lived in... Sorry? They lived in Bedford Park in West London, which was then much less fashionable than it now is, although of course it had been built uh, with artists in mind. Travers carried out a relatively small amount of work before the First World War, and the evidence suggests that he was entranced by Anglo-Catholicism. He got to know some of the younger men who were coming forward in the movement, such as in particular Father Humphrey Whitby, and uh, he was swept up and helped with what has been called the Back to Baroque movement, uh, a, a phrase that was devised by the late Peter Anson. Uh, and what the Back to Baroque movement was, was a feeling among what were then called advanced Anglo-Catholics that Gothic was passe and that what, the, uh, uh, what should be adopted was what would have happened had it, uh, England remained uh, Catholic and the Reformation hadn't happened. In other words, you should make your uh, churches as much like uh, foreign 
Belgian very often, but sometimes French uh, churches uh, and, and Italian uh, with the appropriate uh, furnishings. Uh, and so the step was taken uh, to move away from, as it were, English forms. And this movement was quite powerful in that period before the First World War, and it continued uh, for about 20 years or then about uh, after, the, um, after the end of the war, but by the Second World War uh, was effectively at an end. Travers is always coupled with the Back to Baroque movement, in f but in fact, as we shall see, his output was a great deal more varied than that because there weren't enough churches uh, trying to put that sort of furnishing in uh, for him to live on it. Let's go back for a moment to uh, his life during the war. The peculiarities of his life during the war were two, but they were intertwined. The first was that he was a conscientious objector, which marked him apart from most of his generation and made his widespread involvement in war memorials the more surprising. The transcript of the hearing uh, of, of the tribunal indicates that by that stage, that is the middle of the war, he had no conventional faith. The consequence of his refusal to serve was that he was put into the Friends Ambulance Unit, uh, which were obviously non-combatants, and he worked at a hospital in Birmingham. While he was in Birmingham, he married. Uh, and the woman he married was Christine Wilmore, who was divorced uh, and her husband was still alive. Now, it's perhaps difficult for us to understand how severe were the consequences of divorce and remarriage among all uh, churchmen at that time, and particularly among Anglo Catholics. And it would be a real no no, to put it in slang, uh, as far as most people were concerned. Christine Wilmore was the sister of the Irish actor Michael McLearmore, who in reinvented himself as Irish. McLearmore is not a proper name, it's, the, it's an Irish form for Wilmore, uh, 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 which he, he went to Ireland during the First World War to avoid the draft because there was no conscription in Ireland uh, and uh, soon taught himself Irish uh, and lived there. Christine, uh, like her brother, was beguiling, attractive and volatile, but she was also promiscuous uh, and uh, their married life together was difficult. It's astonishing really, that when one considers it, that during the interwar period, Travers was commissioned by supporters of the Anglo-Catholic movement, bearing in mind these two handicaps, in other words, the conscientious objection and the marriage to a, a divorced lady. Father Whitley, who'd been one of his great uh, supporters, continued to support him, although despite being a, a rich man, he was austere and humorless. Uh, and whether or not he knew, well, he must have known, it seems to me, what had gone on. Uh, he nevertheless supported Martin Travers. As time went by, Travers' practice became more wide-ranging and was never confined to Anglo-Catholics. In particular, his carefully depicted stained glass was installed in many churches, but not in cathedrals or the like. His acceptance in more exalted circles only occurred at the very end of his life, when he was asked to produce an altar set for Jersey to commemorate the liberation of the island, and his client was Her Majesty the Queen, uh, later the Queen Mother. Uh, and they are still there. He also, as I've said, taught stained glass at the uh, at Royal College of Arts for many years, and this enabled him to recruit as assistants those whom he thought were promising. In other words, he used it for his own advantage, as well as obviously being a very conscientious and inspiring teacher. By the early 1930s, Travers' practice was in difficulties <coughs> because the world was going to depression. And also, he had personal problems. In 1927, 
Christine had developed TB and it was decided that she would go to what is then called, what was then called Kenya, uh, where they had relatives, uh, and it was said that the air was good for her. She took a Union Castle ship, uh, which went right round Africa, and while on it, met a Boer farmer to whom she was attracted, and jumped ship in Durban with their two children, uh, and stayed away for two years. When she came back, uh, they resumed married life, uh, as it were, as if nothing had happened. Uh, but it must have been a very odd state of affairs. Since Martin Travers left no personal papers, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence of anybody who knew them during that period of time, it, uh, one can only speculate. In 1934, she died from the TB which recurred, and Travers was left with two teenage children to look after, with both of whom he had a difficult relationship. His son uh, ran away to join the Navy, going back to the traditions of the family, and was effectively disowned by his father for a period of time. And their daughter uh, ran away to uh, Ireland uh, and became an actress, uh, with her uncle, Michael McLearmore. But again, they weren't on good terms. At the end of the Second World War, his practice recovered and he started off well. Uh, the demand for memorials was much less after the Second World War than it was after the First World War, although there was some demand, uh, uh, as we know, because very often uh, names were added to memorials that were already there but he was extremely busy. Uh, and then his sudden death meant that a number of, a large number of commissions that were in train were taken over by those who'd worked uh, with him and for him. Much of Martin Travers' work is now thought by many people to be somewhat passe. It undoubtedly reflected the ideas of the times in which he lived, and those times have now changed. He never, for example, designed an altar for westward celebration, uh, although his versatility was such that he could have done, uh, but of course they weren't found uh, during his lifetime. There is what I hope is a very full catalogue of his work, most of which is in England, uh, but some of which is abroad, uh, in my book, Martin Travers, His Life and Work, that's already been mentioned. And I've seen personally all but three or four of uh, his um, productions in England and quite a large number of those abroad. There are some still on the list, particularly uh, New Zealand, which I haven't yet managed to get to. So what I'm now going to do is go onto the screen and uh, show you a number of pictures, um, not in any particular order, but in categories so they start with stained glass they don't start with stained glass they soon get onto stained glass and then we move on to various uh, other things good now i hope you can now see uh, the um, uh, the first page, as it were, and let's go on to uh, look at uh, some of his work. Apart from doing church furnishings and matters of that sort, he was a consummate artist, uh, and he also uh, did a lot of book illustrations, and these show book illustrations uh, that he carried out, and you will see uh, that the people, and this is a character, this is a characteristic of Martin Travers, the uh, people shown um, are real, look like real people, and he took them from life models. Indeed, it is said that when his wife and children came back from their episode in Africa, which I've just referred to, uh, he used his son's feet for Christ's feet on crucifixes because he hadn't worn shoes for two years and had been wandering around uh, the belt in South Africa. 
this is Martin Travers, uh, is thought to be, and probably is, uh, Martin Travers' first stained glass window. Uh, it's the Virgin and Child, it's obviously, it's a very fine piece of work. It was made for All Saints Church in Norwich, but when that church was closed, it was moved to the nearby St John Timber Hill, to which we'll return in a moment. And uh, there it is. And you can see that by 1910, uh, in other words, very early on in his career, he developed a mastery of uh, placing, of design, uh, and particularly of facial expressions. Because if you look at the child there, you'll see that he actually looks like a child and probably was taken uh, from a real child. Uh, and that makes a lot of difference from inferior artists uh, whose uh, faces on stained glass very often look like robots. This uh, is uh, a, a war memorial done rather late in 1925 and in some ways rather old fashioned. Uh, but typical of a lot that were being done at that time. Uh, and on the right hand side, you could see the various panels that we see round the uh, stained glass. Travers was keen on leaving uh, empty spaces so that not every uh, space was taken up with activity uh, in most of his uh, stained glass. And indeed, he criticised the Victorians for putting too much into windows. Burbage is outside Buxton in Derbyshire, uh, and uh, he did relatively few pieces of work um, in the Midlands and North. Most of his works in the southeast and southwest of England. This window contrary to what I've just said, is rather more crowded, but you'll see that in the background uh, are, are um, buildings and the like, rather than yet more people. And it's uh, Christ being taken to be crucified. It's in the Church of St. Gabriel in Cricklewood in London. And you'll see from the blow up, as it were, on the right, again, how fine uh, all the faces are and the expressions that different people are using, which are appropriate to what it is they're said to be doing uh, in, the, uh, in the scene. This is one of a number of windows that he did in 1927 for St. Saviour's Church for the Deaf in Acton. Uh, and again, uh, if the point needs to be made, you can see the uh, expressions uh, of the mother and child uh, and uh, how well uh, the window, as it were, uh, hangs together. This is a device that he used on a large number or number of paintings, uh, of windows, I'm sorry. Uh, which is the Tree of Life, which you can see in the background on the left-hand side. This is the Church of St Mary at Haddisco in Norfolk. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you can see that there's interest in the background because uh, he's got Our Lady and uh, 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 the Holy Child. And in the background it is Haddisco Church. And that's, again, a device uh, that uh, many stained glass painters used, and he certainly used uh, on occasion. This is a later window of 1940, and some people would think this was slightly mawkish nowadays. It was a lady called Mrs. Edgerton who had already paid for windows to four in the same church for four of her nephews, all of whom had been killed in the First World War. And she's depicted in medieval uh, costume, as you could see, 
before Our Lady and the Child. And again, he used the device uh, of uh, the church in the background. It's a powerful window, but it isn't something which nowadays would be regarded as, um, as, a, as appropriate as it was then. Now, I don't know, but I imagine that he used a painting of the deceased who we must have met because he, he'd uh, done the windows for her nephews a number of years before uh, to get her face. But you can look at that face and say, well, I can recognise so and so. This is one of the relatively few Second World War uh, uh, memorial windows, but it actually commemorates not so much those who died as the fact that uh, Canadian troops were stationed at Bramshot in Hampshire uh, and the arms of the various uh, Canadian provinces are shown in the windows there. And that again shows detail uh, and uh, how well depicted um, everything is. This is another window from St John Timberhill, where we already saw Our Lady, and that shows uh, Christ ascending into heaven. And again, if you look on the right hand side, you can see uh, how well depicted the supporting figures are. This is Ashbury in Oxfordshire, and the lady commemorated there, the Countess of Craven, uh, was a great hunter. So uh, he uh, depicted St. Hubert, uh, who was the patron saint, was and is probably, the patron saint of hunters. Uh, and that shows St. Hubert with the stag. This is a, a, a war memorial rear at loss. We're moving on now to look at some church furnishings. This is now in All Saints, Notting Hill, but it was actually made for the nearby church of St. Columba, Notting Hill. And the uh, St. George and the Dragon motif is another one that Travers used in very many places. Uh, and he's been criticized by many people because he used cheap materials but he used what his clients wanted and could afford and actually uh, that this has been restored as you can see and it's uh, in my judgment quite a powerful um, piece of work this shows how keen some people were to make uh, into Baroque, uh, churches that were by origin Gothic. It, the great church of St Mary Magdalene in Paddington was provided with this side altar and the painting was framed and the tabernacle, a huge tabernacle was erected, uh, all in continental style uh, and other work was done in the church at that time and this picture, if nothing else, reflects the back to Baroque movement. as does this, which was a new, which is a new high altar, still, still in use, which was put into the Church of the Annunciation in Brighton, side, in a side street in Brighton. Uh, and uh, that again uh, shows the motifs that are there in the uh, one that we've just looked at, and it's dated a couple of years uh, later. This, on the other hand, is a, a different way of looking at things. It's 1924, so it's the same time. And it's the church <coughs> in, the, in Barham in Kent, I, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, with an English altar rather than a continental altar, uh, but one that is powerful and uh, dominates the church. 
and you can see how he was able to adapt his skills to all those who wanted work of quality carried out. This is another English altar, although the curtains have obviously gone, uh, where they tripped it in uh, St Mary's Liss in Hampshire. In fact, Liss at one time had more Travers work than almost anywhere else because he did this and windows in the church. Uh, but at the Longmore Camp uh, Chapel, which was very near to this, he did a huge number of windows. Uh, uh, all of which were taken out when the chapel was demolished and are now in a form of parachute packing station in East Yorkshire, to which it's very difficult to get access, but they are magnificent. They're, they're, it's now used as a chapel. This is one of Travers' famous works, uh, the Church of St Swithin at Compton Beecham uh, in Berkshire stroke Oxfordshire which he completely fitted out uh, this tiny uh, downland church for the benefit of Samuel Gurney, who was one of the supporters of the Back to Baroque movement and was church warden there for very many years. And that little church is full of Travers work. You'll see at the time this picture was taken, the Reredos was deteriorating. The small congregation there has since uh, uh, put its uh, collective shoulders to the wheel and a great deal of work has been properly and professionally done to conserve uh, what is there. It looks a great deal better now than it did then. This is a similar uh, altar at St Dunstan's Cranford uh, near London Airport, which was done by uh, done for Father Morris Child, who was again another supporter of the Back to Baroque movement, and he was one of the last to have this sort of altar carried out, because uh, he didn't, in fact, for a variety of reasons, take on his own living until 1935, and when he did, he started internally refurbishing the very fine church in Cranford. You can see on the right hand side of the left hand picture uh, a, a, a tombstone, um, a tomb, and all sorts of other monuments in the church. But in between them, as it were, Travers uh, wove his magic. This is an astonishing piece of work. It's uh, a Reredos in uh, Manor Divey in uh, West Wales, miles from anywhere, um, in, in memory of somebody who died. Uh, and it's very little known, but again, it shows astonishing power. And if you look close up at the uh, uh, angels uh, and the three Marys, you will see that they are depicted as real people uh, rather than, uh, as it were, puppets. This is, this is a table also from St Dunstan's Cranford. Uh, and again, you can see the expression on the face um, on it. Travers was not, as I've said, an architect, uh, but he did uh, in company with a qualified architect, design uh, a few churches which were not, uh, on the whole, successful. Uh, this is Christ the, uh, uh, Christ the King at the Good Church of the Good Shepherd, Carshalton Beaches, for which he designed all the interior, as well as assisting with the, um, with the fabric. Uh, the fabric has had to have extensive repairs and is now in very good condition. Uh, and uh, this was one of his contributions uh, above the high altar. This is, a, again, a most unusual and slightly whimsical uh, piece of work. He did a lot of work in the church of St Dionys in Parsons Green, which was named after St Dionys Back Church in the City of London. And he built uh, or designed a replica of the Wren church uh, to act as the font cover 
uh, for the uh, Victorian church in Parsons Green. Uh, and you can see that in place on the left and then in close up uh, in the centre and on the right. This is the only piece of work that Martin Travers did in Scotland that I went to see last year. And he, he put up a, a large number of plaques of this sort in various parts of the country. Uh, but you can see that it's not only carefully designed, uh, but it has also got uh, arms relevant to the man who died at the top. And at the bottom, uh, next to the Scottish Saltire, it is a ship uh, because his the man drowned uh, when his ship went down. This is something far more conventional, uh, and it shows how, although doing the back to Baroque work, he could also carry out anything that was required. It's a double kneeling desk in Rygate done in 1926. It's well done, but it doesn't stand out unless you know uh, as being Travers' uh, work. Uh, now, finally, um, this is uh, the Shrine of Our Lady, Queen of Peace in St. Mary Bourne Street, uh, where Travers did a great deal of work. The extraordinary thing about this statue uh, is that it is supposed, and I have no reason to doubt it, it's supposed to have been based on his wife as the model. Uh, and uh, his first wife uh, was anything but a queen of peace. Indeed, absolutely the contrary, but she was rather attractive. Uh, and uh, this is another classic um, expression of the back to baroque movement of which st mary bourne street is perhaps one of the leading examples uh, in this country uh, and that's still there uh, and has recently been restored good so that's the end of the slides now if anybody's got any pictures i'll try and get back to the oh, stop share that's what i need to do good so if anybody's got any questions, I'm very happy to take them. And I've got the book here if I can't think of the answer. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Michael. That was fascinating. I'm sure um, people have really enjoyed that and learnt lots. Um, so as Michael said there, um, please do use the comment box below and do um, uh, ask some questions. Um, Michael, um, one of the things you mentioned in your talk is that you talked about um, that the altars he designed, but then you also talked about um, continental altars. What's the difference between a continental altar and an English altar? Well, it, it, English altars were really promoted by Ninian Comper, who, who had taught him for a time. I think Comper's influence on Travers has been overstated in the past. And the form of an English altar was to have four riddle posts with curtains round. That was thought to be English, whether it is or not, I mean, it's open to some doubt. The continental altars were really based on what one could see in Roman Catholic churches in various parts of the continent. And uh, Martin Travers uh, travelled extensively um, in, uh, in Europe um, and had been to lots of different places abroad. Uh, in one of his notebooks, which I looked at once, uh, there was drawings of this, that, and the other, and then in the in the side was how to get to Barcelona by train, and and, and he, he was working out how he could do it. And he certainly went to Italy a lot. And his wife um, was very keen on Italy, and she went. She liked going there. Now, somebody just asked a question, which was, uh, were there any other uh, such um, practitioners? The answer is. Yes, but not really very much. Uh, other people did odd things, uh, but Travers, is, it, it was actually a very small market. I think one has to start from that proposition. Uh, and some people did do things, uh, but um, 
Travers was the man who really led it so far as uh, artistic endeavor is concerned. Uh, there are, and his disciples carried on doing work of a similar sort, though perhaps not as uh, influenced by Baroque, uh, after his death. Uh, and because he taught at the Royal College of Art, um, and that was obviously particularly in, in relation to stained glass, uh, a large number of people who had learned from him, as it were, carried on with his ideas throughout the 1950s. It's very sad, of course, that he died so prematurely young. And I suppose linking into that, um, Michael, so we've had another question coming, sort of, what was he working on when he died and were there any famous pupils he had? Yes. Uh, the answer is he was work he had a huge number of commissions on, on the go, as it were, when he died, because he literally died overnight. He died one weekend, and when the, the men turned up on the Monday morning, they found he died. Um, and so the people who were working for him included Lawrence Lee, who became a very well-known stained glass painter. He, he did uh, a, a lot of work in Coventry Cathedral. He lived to be a huge age, and I interviewed him when he was in his early 90s. Um, and uh, he didn't talk very much, but somebody said um, that he never talked very much, but he was quite illuminating. He was perhaps the best known of Travers' pupils. Another was Francis Stevens, later the Reverend Francis Stevens, who became quite an accomplished stained glass painter in the 1950s did a lot, lot of work for Faithcraft <coughs> and it, his long-term assistant was a man called John Crawford who, who was himself an accomplished artist and he went on to work for Faithcraft uh, and um, did quite a lot of work for them. It's difficult actually, it was difficult, I've more or less got there, um, to work out who did what when he died. I was very much assisted by somebody that I know who found, who was doing work on John Crawford and found that his relatives had preserved literally a suitcase in which were all his papers, many of which were papers prepared by Travers for work that he'd then taken on. And they'd been lost as it were for 60 years, more than 60 years, um, but were extremely helpful. I know yesterday we were talking, um, about Ely Cathedral, because he was working, there was a commission or a design he submitted that was rejected. And we were, I was asking about the, um, where the designs went for that. Do you want to just tell people, because it was a fascinating story. Yes, what I said in the course of the lecture that he began to get some acceptance, as it were, in high circles. He was regarded as a bit, as a bit uh, uh, off beam, as it were, by some people, which is not surprising, very in mind his history. But after the Second World War, uh, he was uh, commissioned by Her Majesty the Queen, and you can't get much higher up than that. But he was also asked by the Dean and Chapter of Ely Cathedral to design a Lady Chapel window. The Lady Chapel window, the east window in the Lady Chapel at Ely is enormous. And it would have been uh, probably the culmination of his work as a stained glass painter. But unfortunately, they didn't like it. Uh, and uh, he, having done the preliminary designs, I don't think full designs, as it were, were ever done. Uh, they sent him away with a flea in his ear, which is a very great shame. There's never been stained glass put in that window ever since. No, um, but thank you. I, I know we were talking about the watercolour. So hopefully, um, if anyone sort of on Facebook has seen any of the designs, we'd love to see and share those with our followers. Um, Mike, we've had quite a few questions coming in now. Um, you said something about his ambivalence of faith. Do you think there was a sense that the more he worked um, and the more commissions he did as he got older, do you think that sense of faith grew at all? It's very difficult to tell. Uh, the answer, as far as I can see, is no. I mean, I think, and because he left no personal papers, it's very difficult to tell. My view is that he was strongly attracted to Anglo Catholicism before the First World War, lost his faith in the war, which a lot of people did, and never really recovered it. Um, what is clear uh, is that uh, he was an agnostic Anglican, if you understand what I mean, because 
there was one point at which his son, who was a small child then, uh, was uh, very ill and they thought he should be baptised. And his wife wanted it, the child baptised as Roman Catholic because she got this Irish thing. Uh, but Travers wouldn't have that and was insistent that he was uh, baptised as an Anglican, um, even though there's no evidence at all that he was um, a regular church attender uh, or in any way committed in those ways. I find it extraordinary, actually, uh, that with all those problems that he had, if you like, problems as far as a church architect is concerned, uh, people still came flooding to him. And I think the reason for that is that he was among the best of his time. Now, and certainly his work shows his um, skill and his craftsmanship there. So uh, thank you for that answer there, Michael. Um, more questions coming in. Um, some of the decorations in the Church of St. John the Baptist, Holland Road, London, is reminiscent of Travers' work. Is there any record of him working there? Uh, the answer is no, he didn't, in a sentence. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've, I've actually been there relatively recently and look, not, not for that reason, but there's no travels worth there. Brilliant, well, thank you, that, that, that really helps. And for those of you wondering other, of what churches um, Travis did, if you do get Michael's book um, here, and you can see it hopefully a bit better there, um, that does list all of the churches that Travers um, work can be seen. There's some really amazing details in this book about it. Um, Michael, did he undertake any secular commissions at all, or were they all churches? They were nearly all churches. The, 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 he did a few gravestones. Um, he did one or two bits and pieces, if I could use that expression, but nothing major uh, by way of secular commissions. Um, he, he had his own field to which he kept, if you, if you understand uh, what, what I mean. And he, the answer is yes, he did, but only a tiny, tiny percentage of any work that he carried out. Brilliant. Um, and I, I'm going to move on because we've got quite a few questions. So um, are there any other examples of his work in Norwich and Norfolk? Uh, yes, the answer is by my book. Uh, but uh, yes, there are. The, the, well, there's St John's Timberhill. Um, there's Haddisco. There's a place called Thurn uh, where there's a, a, a window. Um, there's also a plaque uh, uh, somewhere near Wyndham, I can't remember the name of the place at the moment, uh, which marks where the vicar of the church died. He died while he was in church and they put a plaque on, on, in the floor of the church at the point at which he died. And that was one of Travers' uh, very early works because he had connections in Norwich because he'd been uh, brought up there, as I said. Um, he didn't go to school there, but he, he was brought up there. So the answer is yes, there are a few other uh, ones, uh, and, and um, uh, here we are. Heatherset, that was the place where the, the plaque is, um, and Haddisco I've already mentioned, uh, and there's a little bit of work at Walsingham. Ah, um, oh, and I, I'd forgotten, uh, St Matthew's Thorpe Hamlet. Uh, which uh, was an Anglo, uh, what was a Victorian Norman neo-Norman church, and he did some work for that. And then, uh, whenever 1982, a new church was built in the centre of population of the area, and uh, the furnishings were were moved there. So the answer is yes. There are a number of uh, 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 there are some areas of the country where Travers' work is quite common. Somerset is one of them. London is another. Um, Norfolk, as I say, there's a bit. Uh, Cambridgeshire, for example, is very, very little. Brilliant. Um, so as uh, Michael said there, if you want um, to know more about particular churches and where Travis's work is, it's really well documented in uh, Michael's book. Um, Michael, what materials did he use for his altars? Carved wood, plaster, metal? Anything that was cheap <laughs> is the answer. Um, it varied a great deal, um, and it depended on what the what the um, what the client wanted. 
I mean, the most famous one was St. Saviour's Hoxton, which was destroyed by bombing in the Second World War, uh, where it was said that you could see at the back of the altar, and it was a very, very poor parish, you could see the Tate and Lyle uh, cases at the back of the altar, which had been used to build it up at the back. And certainly there are examples on which uh, he didn't use gold leaf, but rather used silver paper and over uh, silver yeah, silver paper and overpainted it because it was cheaper. And that's why conservation has to take place because a lot of the work, some of the work was done very well, but a lot of the work wasn't. And what I showed you earlier at Compton Beecham is what has happened in a number of places. But at Compton Beecham, where I, I went to talk to them actually a few years ago, uh, which was quite interesting. So I, was, I walked around the church and we looked at different things as we as we went around. Uh, at Compton Beecham, they have made a real, real effort, but it's expensive to get it done um, properly. And I suppose um, it, it wasn't Travers trying to cut corners by using treat cheap materials. It was him trying to, you know, his clients didn't have much money and he was trying to use, which yes. still allowed them to beautify their church spaces. Yes. Um, he wasn't a man to whom money was important. Um, uh, he, some, at some times in his life, particularly in the post First World War period when all this work was running and he was relatively well off. But it, it, he wasn't, it seemed to me, and all I've read, it wasn't something of any great um, uh, importance to him. When he died, he, he owned, I don't know whether you remember that in Talgarth Road, uh, there are a series of studios uh, which were called St Paul's Studios because they're near St Paul's School and they were built especially for artists and they have huge windows in the top and he lived in one and used the other one as a studio and at the top of the one he lived in as a studio uh, and uh, one of those that he had owned was sold to Margot Fontaine uh, who housed her mother in it and she used to go there to get away from her abusive husband from time to time. And I was watching the J.K. Rowling detective, uh, uh, Cameron Strike uh, Cormoran Strike's uh, film the other day, a uh, series on television, and they use one of the, the, there's a murder that takes place in one of those Talgarth Road studios. They're now worth a huge amount of money. But also, the road outside is now the main road to the M4, so it's incredibly busy, which it wasn't in Travers' time. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Um, another question here. Um, so, you mentioned about Compton Beauchamp. Um, the vine covering the walls, um, would this be unique in church furnishing, or was it quite common to have that kind of um, pe um, painting? Uh, the, vine, the vine wasn't done by Travers, it was done by somebody else. Uh, the name of which, the name of whom I forget at the moment. That had been done earlier, so that wasn't him. Um, he didn't touch that. Um, I have seen it in other places. Actually, is the answer. I can't remember offhand the name of the person who did it. It's, again, it's probably in my book. Good. <laughs> and um, talking, you mentioned a. Uh, uh... A couple of times about plaques and memorials. Were memorials often purchased by an individual such as Mrs Edgerton for her four nephews or were they more often or not purchased by the local parish church itself? I think the answer is that the parish usually what happened was they raised money for it. Um, there, there would be an appeal in the parish which would then put a parish war memorial up. Uh, and I think I was trying to stress that some individuals also had had um, uh, memorials put up. Uh, uh, Mrs. Edgerton obviously paid for the, 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 the whole series of windows in relation to her four nephews. And that happened in some other places as well. It's, it's not that common because obviously somebody would have to be relatively well off in order to do that. But there are hardly any churches in England that haven't got First World War memorials. Brilliant. Um, we're coming to the end of our time, so I'm just going to do a couple more questions. Um, we've had a direct message yeah. coming here. So, have you been to St Mary Magdalene Littleton in Middlesex? It has a wonderful rood loft and the rood figures added to a continental screen, as well as candlesticks and a large statue of the Virgin and Child, all fabulous pieces. 
Yes. The, the answer to the question is yes. As I say, I've been to see, I've, I've seen very nearly every piece of Travers work in this country. And uh, th that is uh, a good place to see things. Um, thank you. And I think I've, I've got two more questions. So um, firstly, um, the Church of St. Cuthman, Whitehawk in Brighton, on which Travers worked, was bombed in World War II. How much does the yes. rebuilt church reflect the original building? Very little is the answer. There's a picture in my book, actually, of the church as it was built. And he helped design it. And it was open only for a year or two before it was bombed. A number of the furnishings were removed. Uh, and But the much smaller church of St. Cuthman Whitehall that was rebuilt after the war doesn't in any way reflect what was there before. Uh, I think there's a possibility that some of the foundations were reused, uh, but some of the furnishings were used, although certainly some of them have crumbled with woodworms since. Uh, but there are still, when I last went there, there are still, which was a number of years ago, there are still some pieces of his work there. Brilliant. And um, finally, um, you've mentioned that you've seen um, almost all of his work in England and a fair few of his um, examples of his work abroad. What piece of work are you most looking forward to go and see which you haven't seen yet? Oh, definitely the window in New Zealand. Uh, the biggest window that he did uh, was in Christchurch Cathedral in New Zealand. And it, it was a First World War memorial, but he, he wasn't very um, quick at doing work. Uh, and he delayed and delayed and delayed and it went on for years and years and years and eventually he got it out there just before the second world war started it was really that long um and i was very worried obviously and obviously everybody was worried when he heard about the earthquake in, in in christchurch a few years ago but it, it was all right i think it, it, the the area where it was was bent slightly but it's all been restored and I'm very much hoping to go out there and, and, and see it. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time, Uncle. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. That's been fascinating. So, as I said, this lecture is completely free. So, if you do enjoy our series, please do consider making a donation through our website or text CCT to 70331 to give us a gift of £3. Now, next week, we'll be joined by um, Mr. Gareth Davies, who is a bell ringing historian. And he's going to be talking to us about um, bells and the practice of bell ringing in England. Um, so do join us for that lecture next Thursday at 1 p.m. But do also comment away um, and let us know any suggestions for lectures that you would like us to do. Um, send us a direct message or email digital at the cct.org.uk. But thank you so much for everyone for joining and we look forward to seeing you next week at our next Thursday lunchtime lecture. Good, thank you.